I've been wanting to do a review of some stacks or some electrostatic headphones in general for ages now, and we're finally at that time where I can share with you my thoughts on the SR007 Mark II headphones paired up with a couple of different energizers. To give myself the best understanding of these electrostatic headphones and to share with you the best understanding that I can, I've tried the SR007 Mark II on two different energizers at quite different levels, and I'll explain energizers and everything soon if you don't understand how these all work but I've compared these across two different energizers at two different price points, and then I've also compared them to one of the fastest dynamic driver headphones around at a similar price point and with a matching similar sort of amplifier to the Stax Energizer. So I'll explain all that as we go, but one other thing to know is I'm kind of breaking the rules today. I'm not going to follow the normal cycle that every other headphone review ever does, including mine, and what that means is I'm going to kick off with sound quality. If you want to know about the specifications, comfort, ergonomics, how electrostatics work, all that stuff is going to be in this review, but it's going to be at the back end. Now, I know that's probably a silly idea in terms of maximizing the YouTube algorithm, but I've been chatting to channel patrons recently about what they want most in reviews, and they all said to me that they most appreciate the sound quality and also the comparisons. So I'm going to lead with that. I'm going to get to the high value stuff first, and then you can watch on if you want the rest of it at the end. The only thing I'll tell you by way of introducing these products is that the SR007 Mark II here, that's this guy, comes in at $2,200 US dollars. And then to drive one of these, you do need a separate special energizer, driver, you could call it like a headphone amp for electrostats. And in this case, I've got two. The two that I've got here are the SRM500T. It's a relatively new model from Stax. This comes in at about $1,500 US dollars. And then I've also got the topping EHA5 that comes in at $400. US So a big difference between them. And I'm going to do a separate video all about the EHA5 that's going to come out tomorrow. So make sure you subscribe and ring the notification bell if you want to understand the differences between driving something like the SR007 Mark II from a high-end tube-based driver versus a much more budget entry from topping. But for now, let's jump straight into sound quality on the SR007 Mark II. For most of this testing, I was driving it from the matching Stax SRM500T, and that means we're talking about a total system of around about $3,700. US From that setup, as you might expect if you know anything about electrostats, the sound was crisp and fast from the SR007 Mark II. The good news is there's not really any sense of harshness or sibilance. The tuning of these means that it can get a little bit sort of energetic on certain treble frequencies, but it's not harsh. The quality of the sound coming from these is excellent, what varies is the fact that they're not a dead flat tuning, they have got their own frequency response, and therefore certain frequencies do get a bit enhanced, and that could be a good or a bad thing, depending on your sensitivities to different treble frequencies, your ear anatomy, etc. One thing I really like about the sound of the SR007 Mark II is that the mid-range from them has a good sense of weight and texture to it. It's not too fast, it's not sort of disembodied in any way. One of my concerns coming into this was that the electrostatics in general might lack a bit of decay. And what I mean by that is the amount of time that a sound is able to linger. A very, very fast driver like this one can sort of start and stop super fast. And that can sometimes result in a sound that's unnaturally quick. But I don't find that from the SR007 Mark II, at least not through the mid-range. And so, as I said, you get a really nice combination of weight in the vocals, whether it's male or female vocals, and a nice sense of texture too. So breath, general sort of air movement sort of sounds, plosives, that's pert and burt sounds like that. Your sibilants are good as well, as I've already talked about. And so generally, it's really solid all the way from the mid-range up into the treble. And then as we go down to the bass, things are fairly surprising there too. Sounds like a kick bass have a good sense of punch and drive from the SR007 Mark II. And the extension is also very, very good. If you're listening to electronic music through these, they can rumble, they can give you that sort of real head wobbling sort of feel if you need it. They're not a bassy headphone as such, but they've got it when it's needed. And so from artists that use a fair bit of bass, whether it's Massive Attack, Daft Punk, Felix LeBand, any of those, they're all going to give you a really good sense of the bass depth and the bass presence. So they're quite impressive in that regard. They're not like a lot of stacks have the reputation, and indeed all electrostatics have the reputation to be. They're not lightweight in the bass. Having said all that, I do feel like the bass is just a little bit quicker than I feel like it should be. The punch is there, but it also disappears quite quickly. And so that is the one area that I start to feel like maybe the speed is a slight drawback on the SR007 Mark II, but it is very slight. Now, I've got a comparison coming up, as I said before, with a very fast dynamic driver. So I'll put a bit more kind of context to the bass performance of these shortly. 
but the gist of it is that everything they're doing is very good from bass through treble, they just get a little tiny bit too fast for me in some bass moments. Overall though, what that means is that the tonality of the SR007 Mark II, its tuning if you like, is excellent. It's natural, it's balanced, it handles classical well, it handles rock, pop, jazz, blues, electronic, anything you want to throw at these, it's going to handle it well. And whilst it's not a perfect neutral or reference tuning as such, the tonality of these and the tuning of these doesn't ever draw your attention to any imbalance. Everything sounds natural, sounds lifelike, coming from the SR007 Mark II. When we start talking about technicalities such as detail and resolution, those are actually not as impressive as I expected them to be from an electrostat like the SR007 Mark II. Now, some of that's going to be the tuning. When you do have a richer, warmer tuning, the bass notes can mask some of the mid-range and the treble unless they're enhanced further, which in the case of these, they're not. It's a, it's a more balanced overall tuning rather than a mid-forward and or a treble-forward tuning. And so some of that is going to be coming from some masking from the bass. But at the same time, what I'd also say is that they're not a super-duper kind of resolving or fast-sounding driver. And that's both good and bad. What it means is that if you're coming from a similar kind of setup at a similar level of performance, you're not going to suddenly be hearing things in the music you've never heard before. On the other hand, though, what it also means is that it's a very natural listen. They don't throw details at you for the sake of it, and therefore you get to enjoy the music more rather than focusing on details and technicalities. And I personally prefer that. Whether or not that's what you're looking for, I'll leave that up to you. While we're still talking staging and keeping in mind that this is coming from the SRM 500T Energizer, and that makes a big difference with staging, as I'll explain later, when we talk about staging from the SR007 Mark II, what I would describe it as is very solid, natural staging. It's got good width, a good sense of depth, very good image separation, while still keeping everything coherent. And this goes back to what I was saying about detail and resolution. It's not overly separating details and sounds to make you notice them. It's just delivering it all with a lot of control and a lot of ease. And so the imaging is solid, depth and layering is solid, soundstage width is solid, and general image separation as well. And so all in all, I think they're just a really nice headphone. There's nothing to complain about, but at the same time, there's nothing that really blew me away. I didn't get an experience like I do with, say, my electrostatic Shure IEMs, the KSE-1200s. When I listen to those, there's a level of transparency that nothing at their price point is able to match. Whereas I feel like with the SR007 Mark II, the sound is excellent, it's very, very good, but it's about on par with what I expect at the price point. It doesn't stretch beyond that, it doesn't bring some unique benefit of electrostatics, it's just a different presentation of the similar level of performance. Hopefully that all makes sense. And so just thinking about them in isolation, I think the SR007 Mark II with the SRM500T is a lovely combination. Now, there'll be some of you out there that are going to be telling me you're not getting the most out of these because you're using the Stax Energizer, and I get that. Where I'm looking at this review from, though, is the idea that if someone's looking to get into electrostatics for the first time, kind of like I am, you're probably not going to start out with one of those super top-end energizers like a Blue Hawaii. And so the idea of this review is really to give you a sense of if you're new to electrostatics, if you're just getting into them like I am, this is a very realistic setup that you could go and buy. And so that's why I've focused on this. Yes, like any headphone, you can always get more performance with a higher quality source chain and there are better energizers on the market than the 500T. But at the same time, for about that $3,700 mark, if you're looking for an end game dynamic driver or planar magnetic driver type setup, that's about the budget that you'd probably put aside for a really nice high-end setup. Not top of the range, you can always spend more of course in this hobby, but I think that's about the balance point where you can buy a good setup that's going to be end game for a lot of people that don't feel the need to spend more. And so that's why I'm looking at this particular setup, recognizing there's always room to get better. And so with that in mind, let's do a comparison now. This is the ZMF Verite Open Headphone. It's a beryllium dynamic driver headphone that also retails for that sort of $2,500 mark. So we've got about $2,200 in the SR007 Mark II and about $2,500 for a Verite Open. The reason I chose the Verite Open is partly because they're a very fast dynamic driver. And so a big part of this comparison for me is to see just how fast, how resolving is the stacks compared to a similar level of performance dynamic driver. And then also because of budget alignment, I wanted to test this being driven by a hybrid tube amp because the energizer here from Stax is also a hybrid. 
So the question for me was, if I'm going to spend about $3,500 on a headphone setup of any sort, am I better off spending the money on a dynamic driver setup with a nice hybrid tube amp, or am I better off spending the money on a pair of electrostatics and an energizer like the 500T? And so the amplifier that I used paired up with the Verite Opens was the recently reviewed Sparco's Labs Gemini. And so that amplifier is a hybrid amp. It's a very high quality hybrid amp for about a thousand US dollars. And that means that we're getting a very similar setup for both headphones. That means we've got a $3,500 system in the Verite Opens and the Gemini. And we've got about a $3,700 system in the stack setup. Feeding both of those systems from my Chord M Scaler and TT2. And listening to a bunch of tracks, one of the ones that I settled on for specific note taking was Deep Waters by Incognito. The first thing that stood out to me with the stacks was how good the vocals sounded on this track. It's nicely separated, it's smooth but textured with a good sense of body. And then thinking about the bass, it's got a sense of tactility to it, you can feel it a little bit, but it's also well balanced with the mix. Separation and imaging, as I've already talked about, is excellent from the stacks, but it's also still very coherent, which is important to me. And so that means that sounds like the percussion are clear and crisp, but they're not enhanced, they're not pushed forward. And so I can really focus in on things like the vocals in this track, rather than being distracted by other elements. Moving over then to the Verite Open and the Gemini Amp, and immediately the thing I noticed the most was that the bass sounded more rounded. And what I mean by rounded is it's like the bass didn't just hit and stop. It sort of hit and it mellowed out and then it disappeared. And that sounded more natural to my ears. It was a subtle difference, but it was just enough that I started to hear that thing I spoke about before, which is sort of the over speediness of the electrostatic driver. Now, this is one of those preferential things. Some of you will think that the electrostatic sounds better on the bass. I personally felt like the Verite Open was a little bit more natural, but at the same time, both were very, very enjoyable. So this is not for a second me saying that I took one listen to it and suddenly the Verites were better. It's a different presentation. And in the case of the bass, I do think the Verite Open was just a bit more natural. Something else I noticed from the Verite Open was that there was a little bit more texture coming through in the vocals. There was a little bit more sense of maybe resolution in some of those breathy textural sounds. And that might initially sound like a really good thing, but the drawback of it was it was less smooth. And so it was a little bit less easy to listen to from the Verite Open than the very smooth, refined delivery of the Electrostats. What that also meant was that I was drawn to focus more on the vocals from the Verite Open, and that could be good or bad. It meant that I was less able to listen to the whole picture as evenly and easily on the Verites. With the stacks, everything was laid out in front of me, and I could choose what to focus on. With the Verite Open, it was like it was saying, here's the vocal, focus on this, everything else is there, but don't worry about that. And so some of you are going to love that if you want to focus in on the vocals. Others will actually want that more relaxed presentation from the stacks. Having said that, there is another key to this in terms of relaxation and ease of listening. And I'll get to that when we start talking about ergonomics. So it probably is worth sticking around for that section, even if you just came here for sound quality. I've got some other things to add about using and living with the stacks that I think are quite interesting. Before we get to any of that, the final thing I should say about listening to the Verites compared to the SR007 Mark II is that I do feel like the Verites with the Gemini gave a greater sense of overall separation and imaging placement within the sound. Everything was much more separate, much more sort of defined in space. And again, that could be good or bad. It's one of those things where you may find that you really enjoy the extra separation and being able to focus in on individual instruments, or you might find that you actually prefer, I don't want to say the slightly more coherent sound because both are actually very coherent. Nothing sounds wrong, but there's a sense of completeness and wholeness to the sound from the SR007 Mark II where everything's in place. You can hear where it all is. You're able to listen to each individual piece, as I said before, but it's not forced into separation quite as much. I feel like the Verite Open sort of deliberately splits things apart a bit more, possibly due to the tuning, possibly due to the driver technicalities. I'm not entirely sure on that one. And that's a question that I'd love to answer by trying more stacks in the future. And on that note, to help me with that, if you want to see more reviews of other electrostatics, if you want me to go up to the SR009 or the SR9000, for instance, the best things you can do are make sure you're subscribed if you haven't already. But even more importantly than that, hit the like button and even leave me a comment down below. Which electrostatic would you like to see me review next? Because then I can ask the supplier if they're able to loan me whatever there's the most interest for. So hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and let me know in the comments which electrostatic headphone you'd like to see me try out next.
But for now, let's close out the comparison of the SR007 Mark II and the Verite Open setup by saying that I think both of them are actually on par in terms of technical performance. If you spend yourself about $3,500 on a system like the SR007 Mark II and the SRM500T, what you're going to be getting is about the same performance as you would get with a traditional headphone setup. What it means is that you kind of know what to expect. If you've experienced this level of headphone performance, and I mean traditional headphone performance, then you kind of know what to expect when you go into electrostatics at the same sort of price point. On the other hand, it also might say to you that there's maybe not a lot of point doing a sidestep out of, say, a dynamic setup into electrostatics. But of course, that's also going to depend a little bit on exactly which electrostatics you go for. And so as I said before, I do intend to try to review more electrostats. I look forward to understanding them better as I try more of them. But hopefully this is painting you a picture at the starting point that they're a different presentation. They're not inherently better or worse. They're just a bit different. And I have to therefore leave that decision up to you, hoping that I've painted you a bit of a picture of what to expect. But before you make your decision on sound quality alone, let's talk a little bit about things like specifications, design, and ergonomics with the SR007 Mark II. As I said earlier, these come in at $2,200 US dollars. For that money, what you're getting is the headphone with the attached cable. And yes, this is, just double checking, it is an attached cable. You can't remove the cable. And they will absolutely need some sort of energizer to drive them. And so you can start with an energizer as low in price as the topping EHA5 over here for $399 US dollars. Remember, I'm going to do a review of that one tomorrow in a separate video. If this video has been out for a while, there's a link down in the description below. You can go and check out the EHA5 review straight after this one. But the reason I'm emphasizing that is you can't just go and buy a pair of these and plug it into your existing headphone amplifier. And the reason for that comes down to how electrostats work. So let's do a quick sidestep into that for just a moment. Inside a pair of electrostatic headphones is a very, very thin diaphragm. And what happens is there's a high voltage, in this case it's 580 volt, that's put through that diaphragm, creating a static electrical charge. What then happens is the musical signal coming from your DAC is passed through plates on either side of that statically charged sheet or diaphragm. And then as the musical signal changes, it makes the diaphragm want to be pulled towards or away from each of the plates. And so what happens then is the diaphragm moves along with the changing polarity, the positive and negative charges of the musical signal. So keeping in mind that a musical signal is a whole lot of positive and negative waves. As those changes in voltage flow through the panels on either side of the diaphragm, the diaphragm is pushed and pulled, which moves air and creates the sound. That's a very rudimentary explanation, but hopefully gives you an idea of what's going on. And that goes to explain as well why we need these energizers. Because you need that 580 volt bias charge going through the diaphragm. And then on top of that, you need a very high voltage charge going through the plates or the grids, which is where the music goes through to make that diaphragm move. And so that leads to a couple of challenges that I've found in living with an electrostatic headphone. The first one is you can't just go and buy one and plug it into your normal headphone amplifier. You have to have an energizer and that energizer cannot drive your regular headphones. So it's a dedicated system that might be fine for you. It might not be fine for you. I'll leave that up to you. But it does mean an extra box and an extra set of connections in your system that can only drive one type of headphone. Now, the good news is most of these energizers are going to have a pass through function. So when you switch off the energizer, it releases whatever signals coming in and passes it onto the next device, meaning that you could very easily go from your DAC into an energizer. When you're using it, that signal is being taken by the energizer. When you switch it off, it gets passed out of a rear connection on the energizer and onto, say, a headphone amp, a power amp, etc. The other thing that it means, though, is that the cables that are used for electrostatics are quite different. Instead of just having two wires to each cup being a positive and a negative, we now actually have three because we have to carry the positive and the negative as well as create that static charge on the diaphragm. It also means that these cables have to be able to carry high voltage effectively, and that can mean that you're either unable to remove them and change them over, or if you do want to remove them and change them over, finding aftermarket cables isn't quite as easy as it would be with a regular headphone. Now, you might not care about cables, that's totally fine, but it is worth considering for those that maybe have cables, that like to swap cables, you can't do that with all electrostatics. In the case of the SR007, it means that we've got this cable physically attached to the headphone, and this starts to bring up some of the ergonomics challenges that I've found with the SR007 Mark II. And by the way, I really like these headphones, I've enjoyed owning them and using them, but when I said before there was a little bit more to it than just the sound quality, the couple of things that I don't necessarily like about the SR007 Mark II is the fact that this cable is attached. That doesn't worry me so much. The bit that actually worries me is the quality of the cable, not the quality. The quality is fine. It's the ergonomics of the cable. 
the design of the cable, I probably should have said, instead of quality. This cable is a bit unwieldy because it's a ribbon cable. It doesn't sit nicely. It sort of wants to flop all together. It's harder to drape across a desk or kind of bundle up when you're not using the headphone. I find it a less enjoyable cable to wear, kind of draping down the shoulders and across the chest. In all those ways, it's just not as nice as a good quality headphone cable. And then on top of that, the fact that you do have to use a dedicated driver, that just takes a step back for ease of use for me when it comes to electrostatics versus a dynamic or planar magnetic driver. On the other hand, some things I really like about the SR007 Mark II is it's very, very adjustable. So what you've got in the design of these is a fully swiveling earpad system. So you can adjust the angle of the ear pads very precisely to suit your head, your ear shape, your ear size, positioning, get full comfort of them. That also means that the cable exit will also swivel, as you can see here. So theoretically, you could position it going down behind your back if you wanted to. You can have it straight down onto your shoulders, coming forward so it sort of drapes in front of your shoulders. That's fantastic. I really like that idea. But then the other thing that I'm not such a fan of is this suspension style headband. This pair has been a demo pair for a long, long time, I believe. And you can kind of see how that headband is just flopping around in the wind there. I think the elastic has probably long lost its tension. And this is an issue I have with any such headband design. Anytime there's elastic used, that elastic is 100% going to wear out. And that means that you'll go from a headphone that might fit you beautifully when you first get it to eventually becoming a bit loose and a bit floppy and soggy on the head. In this case, I think I'd say they still fit okay. They don't feel overly secure, but the comfort's fine. The weight is still distributed nicely across the top of the head and they're nice and light too. So that's all really positive. I think the comfort factor, the wearability of these once they're on the head is great. My only real drawback is this cable and it is enough to reduce my kind of excitement or enthusiasm to reach for the SR007 Mark II when I've got other headphones around me, like the Verite Open, that are just more comfortable, almost entirely due to the cable. They're heavier, those being the Verite Opens. They probably don't sit quite as nicely on the head because they haven't got all this adjustment that the SR007 Mark II has. But just the interactions with this cable, I find really, uh, not, it's not as far as frustrating, but it's just not as enjoyable as I wish it was. And so that for me is probably the biggest drawback I have with the SR007 Mark II. Beyond that, I think they're a wonderful headphone. They look good. They're very comfortable on the head. I've already talked about sound and they're great sounding headphones at their price. And so that's all fantastic. Now, one other thing I probably should mention about the SR007 Mark II at this stage is they're also quite a different design. If you look inside the grill of them there, you'll see this kind of like a solid gold electrode. What is happening here that's different from other Stax models is that there are no holes in this one, no large holes anyway. And the reason that's been done is to deliberately create a headphone in the SR007 Mark II that is more bass oriented. Again, it's not a bass monster. It's quite a neutral and balanced tonality overall, but it has more bass than some other electrostatic models. And this has been a deliberate design choice by Stax to produce a headphone with more bass by producing a rear electrode with no holes. If you look at photos of other electrostats like the SR009, those have got a very different look through the back grille and that's going to allow more airflow but also reduce the amount of bass. And I raise that for two reasons. One of them is to say that if you're looking for an electrostatic and you want more bass, the SR007 Mark II probably is the choice. But at the same time, I wonder if this design and the reduction of airflow that it creates is maybe also part of why it's not a super duper resolution monster. And so hopefully I'll get a chance to try the 009 or 005, one of the other models on either side of the SR007, because I'll be curious to see if the sound of these being tuned for more bass has also counteracted their ability to do resolution. Or if maybe I'm just used to some wonderful headphone setups and you don't really get more when you go to electrostatics, you just get different. That's a question to be answered still. The final thing I do want to talk about briefly in this review before we wrap it up and then leave you until tomorrow's review for the EHA5 is I want to give you a quick look at the SRM500T Energizer. Just in case you're considering getting this as a bundle, that being the SR007 Mark II and the SRM500T, if we look at the SRM500T, a couple of things, I've already mentioned the fact that it runs tubes, so that's what these two kind of circular sections are and they're slightly raised on the top of the Energizer, therefore the tubes house on the inside. 
And then other than that, it's like a normal headphone amp. It's got a power button on the front. It's got two outputs for headphones, so you can plug in two sets of electrostatic headphones if you want to. It's then got a volume control here, which is quite a cool volume control because it's a split control. And what that means is that if you need balance, you can actually adjust one channel separately from the other. But the good news is that unless you're specifically trying to split the volume, it will always move as one. So once it's set the way you want it, you just turn it normally and your balance difference is set. So it's a really lovely and simple implementation. If we then quickly roll around to the back of the Energizer, what you'll see here is that we've got power going in, of course. We've got a separate ground should you need it for ground loops, etc. We've then got an RCA input and RCA pass through. That's what I spoke about before if you need to daisy chain your devices together. And then we've also got XLR input. Now it's worth noting you can only run XLR or RCA at any one point in time. There's a switch on the back here to choose which one's in use. And so the point of me saying that is that it's not so convenient to plug in both an XLR and an RCA source and switch it easily. You'd have to access the back. It's not designed just to toggle from the front. Beyond that though, like I said, it operates like a normal headphone amp. It's just running a really high voltage signal. And so hopefully that gives you a really quick sense of the SRM500T. As I said, it's not really a review of the Energizer, but I wanted you to understand what we're talking about here. So that's the system I've been testing mostly with. I've got the follow-up review coming tomorrow with the EHA5. And the one thing I'll say now is that the difference between this $400 unit and this $1,500 unit is not as big as the price tag would suggest. I'm not going to say which one I prefer at this stage. I'll let you watch the video and find out. But I was really surprised at what I heard in looking at these two. They're designed quite differently. Their specs are quite different. But the end result of the comparison didn't maybe reflect that quite so much. And so I'm going to wrap things up here for now by saying that I've really enjoyed my time with the SR007 Mark II. It's not taken me to a point where I want to rush out and buy a pair for myself. It's been a very enjoyable listen, a very enjoyable experience. But the reality for me with this particular model, so this is not a blanket statement about electrostatics or stacks, but in the case of the SR007 Mark II with the SRM500T, it kind of gave me the sense that I'm okay with the stuff I've already got. It hasn't made me want to rush out and get into electrostats. On the other hand, if you're looking at getting into a high-end headphone system and you don't yet have all the gear that I have, the headphones that I have that already perform at this level, if you're looking to spend about $3,500 on a wonderful headphone system, the one thing I'd definitely say is that the SR007 Mark II gives you a very relaxed and yet highly capable, highly technical and resolving performance that almost doesn't sound like it is. And I mean that in a really positive way. It's a relaxing and easy to listen to music system that's got buckets of detail, resolution, and separation without forcing any of it at you. And so if that sounds good to you, I do think the stacks are worth investigating. I think if you've already got a system like the Verite and a nice amplifier, maybe not so much, but then that's where probably there's a different stacks model that might do things a bit differently than the SR007 Mark II. And so as one final reminder, if you want to see me do more electrostatic reviews, hit the like button, make sure you subscribe, and leave me a comment down below which electrostatic headphone, be it stacks or something else, which one do you think I should check out next? For now though, it's time for me to leave you to the music, so happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.